Today we're going to be talking about volcanoes, which is one of my favorite subjects in geology. And one of the things that people often wonder about volcanoes is why are some volcanoes kind of quiet like this one? This is Eyjafjallajökull in Iceland back when it erupted in 2010. And there you could kind of drive up to the, uh, the lava there and uh, take a look at it. Or here we are in uh, Kilauea in Hawaii uh, making grilled cheese over the heat of the lava. And you can do that in some places and it's um, relatively safe. Uh, but then there's other volcanoes that are like this, like Mount St. Helens that erupted in 1980 with a giant explosion. Or there's things like, um, uh, I think almost everyone knows about how Mount Vesuvius buried the Roman city of Pompeii and, and uh, uh, captured all the, the people in the city when it erupted. And uh, you might be thinking, well, how come in some places you can go toast marshmallows and make grilled cheese and not feel like you're about to die, whereas other volcanoes are so explosive when they erupt? What controls that behavior of those volcanoes? And that's one of the many things we are going to learn about volcanoes today. So first of all, I just want to remind you about where volcanoes form. Volcanoes do not form everywhere on the planet. You have to have rock melting. And we talked about this back when we went over igneous rocks. And I showed you this diagram here, where this is our normal circumstance. And on this graph, we have um, depth plotted on the y-axis, and then temperature on the x-axis. And in red, we have that geothermal gradient, that increase of temperature with depth. And then in green, we have the melting point of rocks. And in normal situations, what's going on at most of the planet, um, the geothermal gradient never reaches the melting point of the rocks. So you don't have volcanoes there because you don't have any uh, rock melting there. Um, so that's why we don't have volcanoes here, or you don't have volcanoes in Nebraska or something. However, there are three circumstances where you get this melting occurring. Remember, you can have lower pressure, so you have hot rocks at lower pressure. That's what you get at divergent plate boundaries, like the mid-ocean ridge or rift valleys. You can have extra heat like what you get at a mantle plume, or you can have that addition of volatiles, like what you get at a subduction zone. So those are really the three places on the planet where we tend to see volcanic activity. Rift zones, subduction zones, and mantle plumes. All right, so just remember that when you're wondering why don't we get volcanoes all over the place? Why do we have them in certain areas? For example, you've probably heard of the ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean, right? You know, old Johnny Cash song? Oh, that, I don't think he was singing about volcanoes. But anyway, um, the ring of fire is called that because there's subduction zones all around the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And then subduction zones create volcanoes. That's why you have volcanoes all around the Pacific. So anyway, now that you have that nice little reminder about where we get volcanoes, let's think about why some of those volcanoes are dangerous and explosive and other volcanoes are pretty, uh, you know, calm. A lot of this goes down to something called viscosity. Viscosity is a fluid's resistance to flow. And lava, being a liquid, or magma when it's underground, is a liquid, and a liquid is a fluid. So different types of lava will have different viscosity. And what does viscosity mean? Well, if something has low viscosity, it's going to flow really, really easily, like water. If something has high viscosity, it flows really slowly. It's going to be really, really gooey, like cold molasses or something. And uh, different lavas, some of them flow really easily. They have low viscosity. Some of them flow really hard, very, very slowly, have high viscosity. 
And the viscosity of a, a lava is controlled by two characteristics. Well, for the most part, these are the two really important characteristics. One is silica content. The more silica, the higher the viscosity. And the reason for this, remember those little silicate tetrahedra that I talked about? They're the building blocks of every silicate mineral. Well, the more of those that you have, they like to stick to each other. So if you have more of them, you have more of them trying to stick to each other, so your lava gets a whole lot stickier and gooier. So you get higher viscosity. Now the other thing is temperature. The higher the temperature, the lower the viscosity. So hotter lava is gonna flow easier. So let's have a nice little review of our type of lava that we have. So remember we have felsic intermediate and mafic compositions. Yes, I'm leaving off the ultramafic because ultramafic rocks do not erupt on Earth's surface anymore. So we don't have to worry about them now. All right, there's our lava names, rhyolite, andesite, and basalt. And let's look at the temperatures these things erupt at. So rhyolite erupts at 600 to 800 degrees Celsius, andesite 800 to 1,000, basalt 1,000 to 1,200, although it's actually being registered as high as 1,400 degrees Celsius. And then over here we have the silica, with rhyolite having the most, basalt having the least, and andesite in between. So what's that tell us then about the viscosity? Who's going to have the highest viscosity? Well remember, the higher the silica, the higher the viscosity, the lower the temperature, the higher the viscosity. Right? Something like that. So here we have rhyolite, low temperature, high viscosity. This is going to have, or high silica, it's going to have high viscosity. Basalt erupts at the hottest temperature with the lowest silica. This is going to have low viscosity. And guess what? Andesite, it's intermediate, it's always going to be in the middle, so it has kind of medium. Right? So let's put this together then and see how viscosity affects the way a volcano erupts. So there's one more important part to the uh, the character of a volcano, and that is the gas content. All magma contains dissolved gases. That's those volatiles we were talking about in the past. And uh, as the magma rises, the pressure on it drops. And when the pressure drops, the gases come out of solution. This is very much what happens, let's say you're having a soda, you're opening a bottle of Coca-Cola or something, and when you open that bottle of Coca-Cola, you hear that little whoosh coming out. That's because soda is carbonated, it has carbon dioxide in solution, and as long as the cap is on, it's holding that carbon dioxide under pressure in solution. You take the cap off, you reduce the pressure, those bubbles come out of solution. Same thing happens to magma as it rises. You, you get the pressure getting lower, and the magma is then, um, uh, the bubbles are going to come out a solution in the magma. And that's what we're trying to show right here. Down here, there's enough pressure on the magma, so all the gases stay in solution. But as that magma rises upwards, the gases come out of solution. And here's the key thing to controlling eruptions. If the lava is low viscosity, if it flows nice and easy, those bubbles get out of the solution really easily. Right? They just bubble out nicely. If the magma is very viscous and very gloppy and very gooey, the gases get stuck in there and they can't find their way out. And so the pressure, the gas pressure, is going to build more and more and more. Eventually, it's going to build so much that it explodes out of the volcano. So typically, 
if you have lower viscosity lava, you tend to have calmer eruptions, not as explosive eruptions. If you have high viscosity lava, you have explosive eruptions. So once again, if we look here at our different lava types, you would expect the mafic lavas to be pretty quiet. And yes, that's what you have down in Hawaii, where you can walk up to the lava flows and, you know, cook on them. Well, I don't recommend doing that, but, you know, you can, uh, it's, it's not that explosive. And rhyolite, which is very viscous, allows the gases to build up, and these are usually going to be your very explosive eruptions. So that viscosity and the gas content is going to affect what type of eruption you get from a volcano. What we're showing here, this is, uh, hopefully you remember from Igneous Rock Lab, this is vesicular basalt. And all those little bubbles that you see there are where those gases were bubbling out of solution uh, as that lava erupted. All right, let's talk a little bit about what comes out, <clears throat> excuse me, what comes out of a volcano when we have volcanic eruptions? Because it's actually not just lava that's coming out of the volcano. Other things do as well. And uh, we're going to start, though, with the lava because that's uh, what most people think of. And when it comes to lava, most commonly you're going to see flows of basaltic lava. Basalt, because it's runny, it tends to flow, come to the surface and flow out of the surface. So you see a lot of basalt lava flows. But depending on where they're flowing and the exact temperature and things like that, you're going to get different shapes to those lava flows as they flow onto the surface. And one of those names is Pohoihoi. And yes, that's a kind of weird name, but it's a Hawaiian term. And who knows more about, um, you know, uh, lava flows and people who live right on top of an entire island of lava flows, right? So Pahoehoe lava is ropey lava. And what we mean by ropey, notice the surface of this Pahoehoe lava, it looks like there's these coils of rope there. And this forms because the top of the lava flow cools faster than the center of the lava flow. So the center of the flow is still moving, the top is cooling down, and so it kind of gets curled up on itself. And I will show you some video of this forming in just a moment. Now another type of lava that you can get from basalt is called a'a. Uh -uh. And a'a uh -uh is blocky lava. Blocky lava um, is not going to have those nice ropes on it. It's going to be these jagged bits and pieces. See all these jagged bits and pieces there? Here you can see some pohoihoi there, but some ah uh -uh there. Um, and this forms mainly because you have this lava flow that's very slowly flowing, and as it cools, it contracts. And as it contracts, like pieces, these blocky pieces pull away from each other and tumble off the lava flow. And again, I'll show you some video of this. Now, last of the types of lava that like basalt will create as it erupts on Earth's surface is something called pillow lava. And pillow lava is where you get these blobs, these rounded blobs of lava erupting. And this happens when it erupts underwater. So as the lava comes out and hits that cold water, it quenches the lava immediately into this like little blob, but more lava keeps coming out. And so you get a whole bunch of these rounded blobs of lava. And anytime you see that, you know that lava originally erupted underwater. So let's take a look at some of these lava in action. And we're going to start with um, Hawaii. So this is off in uh, Hawaii, and uh, we can see some of this lava um, erupting. 
And in a moment, we're going to see where the top of it is going to start cooling and getting that wrinkled pohoi hoi surface to it. And we're about to go there. And come on, dude. Pan down. <laughs> there we go. See how it's flowing here? The top is starting to cool, and so that top gets those, those wrinkles developing in it. And that's very typical pohoi hoi. So let's take a look then at ah uh ah. -uh. Again, we're going to be in Hawaii looking at this ah uh ah -uh flow. Notice that reddish middle, that's where it's still um, uh, liquid, and it's flowing very slowly, but as it cools and contracts, gets smaller, these pieces start breaking off it. And as these pieces start breaking off, you're left with that very rubbly, jagged surface to the ah-ah uh -uh flow. I don't know about you guys, but I love watching lava flows. It, it could, I could just like, if I have a bad day, I could watch hours of this and just be, you know, happy. Oop, there a piece fell off. All right, let's then look at pillow lavas. Pillow lavas only erupt underwater. Don't try this at home. But let's take a look at pillow lavas erupting. Uh, there we go. There are some lavas coming out. You can see that rounded um, uh, texture created. There another rounded blob came out and then another one's going to work its way out. And that's how those pillows get developed. I always thought it looked like some kind of alien coming out. There we see some more. It's really kind of cool. Ooh, there's another pillow. Here's a neat pillow. So anyway, that's how your pohoi hoi, ah uh, ah, uh, and pillow lavas end up forming. Now, with lava flows, you can get a few other unique um, features developed in lava flows. And one that you'll see in various uh, large basalt flows uh, around the world is something called columnar jointing. So what happens to create columnar jointing? You get this big lava flow that flows, it cools, and then as it cools, remember the big thing about uh, substances is as they cool, they contract, they get smaller. And when that contracts, um, cracks are created in the lava flow and they have a pattern to those cracks. And here we're off on Staffa in uh, Scotland, and there's our columnar joints that are created, right? Columnar meaning columns are created. And if we look down on these columns, you can see there's the cracks that were created as, um, as that lava flow cooled. Now, you don't have to go all the way to Scotland to see this or to Ireland. There's a place called uh, the Giant's Causeway. You can actually go into the uh, Pacific Northwest to the uh, Columbia River Plateau in uh, Washington State, and you'll see a lot of columnar jointing there as well. Another neat thing that forms in lava flows are tree molds and lava trees. And these form as lava flows into a forest and it flows around trees and solidifies. And so what you might get is a tree mold where this lava flowed around the tree, it solidified, and then because the lava was still hot, it actually burned away the tree. Right down there is the tree mold, and that's the tree that used to be growing there. You'll see these, again, all over in Hawaii and parts of New Mexico where there's lava flows and up in Idaho and uh, other places. There's another view of one of these tree molds that's created. Now, lava trees, this is a lava tree right there. The lava tree gets created as lava flows around the tree cools right against the tree because the tree is very cold compared to the lava flow and uh, the rest of the lava flow kind of flows away and leaves this this uh, kind of incl tree enclosed in lava behind it. And so you, these are just some of those neat things you might see in places where basaltic lava flows have occurred. 
But I do want to let you know that lava flows are not, uh, uh, oh, there's also one more neat thing that you can get in basaltic lava flows. And those are lava tubes. And this is basically a cave in a lava flow. These form where the top of the lava flow solidifies, but the center part of the lava flow continues to move. And so eventually, all of the flowing lava flows away and leaves basically this cave behind. You can see that right here. There used to be a lava flow flowing through that. The top of the lava flow solidified. The rest of it kept flowing along. And there you can see inside one of these lava tubes, one of these special like caves created by flowing lava. But lava, uh, uh, lava is not the only thing that comes out of a volcano and creates really neat stuff. There are other products that are created in eruptions. And we're gonna talk about those in volume two.